Hello everyone. Welcome to Classroom 2.0 Live for Saturday, December 5th. Our topic today is Tech Tools to Amplify Your Classroom. Our special guest is Reference Davis. Your show hosts are Peggy George, Lori Moffat, and Tammy Moore. Thank you to Tammy for doing our closed captioning. And I'm going to turn the mic over to Paula Noggle, who will introduce our guest as well as ask the newbie question. Good morning, everyone. This is Paula Noggle from New Orleans, Louisiana. And I am thrilled to be here on Classroom 2.0 Live. And I uh, have the pleasure of introducing Rafranz. I first met Rafranz in the summer of 2003 at the TCEA Area 7 Conference in White Oak, Texas, where we were both presenting. Later that summer, we reconnected at the OST Conference in San Antonio and then spent a week together at the Den Summer Institute in Burlington, Vermont. I am thrilled to introduce my good friend to our audience today. So Franz Davis is the Executive Director of Professional and Digital Learning for Lufkin ISD in Texas. In this role, she supports the growth of district leaders, teachers, and students through the lens of personalized learning, creativity, collaboration, communication, and critical thinking. She is a Google Certified Innovator, a Microsoft Innovative Education Expert, and serves in advisory roles for multiple technology companies and organizations, including the ISTE community as the chairperson of the Digital Equity Network. For many years before she became an instructional technology specialist, Rafanz was a math teacher and math strategist supporting other math teachers. As an advocate for passion-based learning, Rafanz uses her experience as a secondary math teacher to help teachers integrate technology using innovative teaching strategies aimed at empowering students to become autonomous learners. As a writer and speaker, Rifranz frequently draws upon her background as a parent and woman of color to offer ideas and insights into how technology can be used in schools to not only break barriers, but to provide opportunities and instruments of, I'm sorry, and instruments for diverse students' voices. Rifranz uses her voice in education to speak at local, state, and national events on topics such as connected learning, digital equity, student data and privacy, creativity, digital learning tools, and diversity in ed tech. In 2014, Rafranz was invited to the White House as a speaker for the official launch of the Connect Ed Initiative, where she spoke on future-ready professional learning through the lens of her district. She is the author of the book, The Missing Voices in Ed Tech, Bringing Diversity to EdTech, and is a two-time BAMI Award finalist for the School Technologist of the Year. Wow. We are thrilled to have Rafranz as our guest speaker today. And here is the newbie question that she will um, answer. What is student voice, and why is it important in the classroom? So I will now turn it over to my dear friend, Rafranz. Wow, I I feel like I need to go home now. <laughs> I, was, I was like, oh, I need to shorten that bio a lot. Um, thank you so much for having me. Um, the newbie question, what is student voice and why is it important? You know, I love this question because the very first time and before student voice really became such the buzzword that it has become, unfortunately, um, it, it was really about what your students, how they learned and what inspired them and um, really their feedback from everything to the, I, I like to call it the art of schooling, to, um, to how, how, how school is kind of presented in a certain way to them. I remember being at a conference and the presenters were talking about student voice and honestly it was all about the students just recording, reading and writing or recording a math lesson. 
And I, and I would like for us to get deeper than that when it comes to student voice. Yes, they can share how they learn, but they can also share ideas that can impact their school community. Um, and, you know, it's important not just to the classroom, but it's important to the district as a whole. I, I have a phenomenal superintendent. Her name is Dr. Latanya Goffney. I believe she's Dr. Goffney on Twitter. Um, I'll put it in the comment section. Uh, but she actually has a, um, a student advisory board. And I got to meet with them because we have some pretty neat activities planned with this group. But the most empowering part was all of these student leaders came with things that they wanted to address in school and solutions that they felt could be put in place to address them. Because that's their norm, that you come in with, here's the thing that is not right, but here's an idea to fix it. And I don't think I've ever truly understood student voice until I sat there and I listened to every last one of them talk about challenges that they're having, not even necessarily in the lesson. It could have been simple things like the, the faucet isn't working in the bathroom, um, or we get out of tennis on one side of the building, but we are having the park all the way on the other, and when we get out, it's dark. Can you put lights in the parking lot or allow us to park by the tennis center? I mean, it was just truly um, empowering to listen to them. So um, I, I, I think I answered that question. Hopefully I did. And, Hopefully in your schools, you're finding ways to bring your students into the process because at the end of the day, that's what student voice is about. It's about them having um, a say and a voice in the entire process. Um, so, it, and I guess I'm going to move on with slides now. Are we, are we good? Oh, all right, good. So now we're going to talk about tech tools to amplify your classroom. But before we get started, um, and I know that I'm glad you did the pre-poll question, so I know that pretty much everything is new. I do want to talk about, like, specifically some things that we're doing and why these, um, why these are important. Right now is the hour of code, and a large majority of you are doing hour of code, and it's great. Um, but there are still quite a few of you who weren't, or maybe it wasn't quite something you needed to look at in your school. I'm not sure, but I just want to share that one of our challenges this week is we're not counting the lines of code that students code, like a lot of schools are counting that. We're actually counting how much you amplify and talk about the, what you're doing in your classroom. And that's, that's a, that to me is, is, is a really big deal. It just amplifies the idea. I, I think that something like coding, and I know this is not what this is about, is completely important as well because when you think about computational literacy, the, the ability to, number one, go online to an open program and create a webinar to share with teachers all over the world. That really is a type of computational literacy. Not even just the idea of creating the platform to do it itself, but just the fact that it can be done. Someone had an idea and did that. The person that could have those ideas could be in your classroom right now. And the thing is, how will they know if they want to create platforms, or if they want to design games, or if they want to um, to tell stories in really interesting ways if we don't give them the opportunity to do it. And that really is what our code is about. So when I talk about these tools to amplify your classroom, I'm, 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 I'm teaching and talking about the same tools that hopefully our teachers will use to not just share a tweet, not just share um, a single blog post, but to truly tell a culminative story. Um, for me, this whole idea of how we share started with George Kuros, and I think I'll probably shout this guy out with every session that I do. Um, the same year that I met Paul Noggle, the same year I met George at ISTE. And he said to me, um, Franz, what can you teach me and where are you sharing it? And that was such a profound statement. And I actually use that even with our teachers today. Why? Right, what can you teach me and where are you sharing it? Um, and it's, it's, it is, it's not just um, like teachers, and I was one of those teachers too, where we really, I think we do the core of our work, of course, in our classroom. Um, but when we're not uh, sharing that work or we're not talking about what goes in our classroom, that kind of honestly lends, that, lends the, the story of your classroom for others to tell. And believe it or not, whether you're sharing or not, it's being shared because the people that are talking are your students. All the kids know who the easy teacher is. They know who the teacher is that's going to hold them accountable. They know who the teacher is that's going to challenge them. The parents know who you are. 
they're already calling the school before the school year started, making sure their kid is in your class, or unfortunately in some cases, making sure the kids are not in your class. Those things are happening whether you like it or not. So amplifying and sharing what you do in your classroom gives you the ability to, to frame your story. And that is so important to um, the, the message that you want to send, but also how you communicate what education team is like from your voice. And it's even more important, of course, for your students to tell that. Um, so even though you might not be using some of these tools yet with your students, and I'll admit, the school district that I'm in, I've been in Lufkin since June, we're just now at this point. Um, we're participating in our code because, honestly, I, I felt like our teachers needed to have some type of understanding that kids could do incredible things if we allowed them to do it. Our code was like a window in order to do that, and the bonuses we get to talk about the importance of computer science and education. The other side of that is, on top of our code, now we also get to talk about the, how you share that, and how you share that not just with the teachers in your building, but with your community and with the world. And I love that quote from George. It's in his book, The Innovator's Mindset. Inspiration is everywhere, and often in unexpected places. You just have to keep your eyes open. And that was such a breath of fresh air um, to read that particular quote in that book. So how do I share my classroom? Uh, the number one way I like to share is through my blog. Now, I will admit, I, am, um, I haven't blogged on my own personal blog in uh, probably a month or so. Shame on me. Um, and honestly, not really shame on me, because sometimes life is just like that, and it's OK. Um, I, it's, it's one of those things, and I think many of you can relate, is for me, it is you get so um, bogged down with all of the different things that you're working on until finding even the time to sit down and frame that is difficult. And when I blog, um, I like to really go really deep into thought. So sometimes it's not always the easiest thing to do is to start a blog post. It's not. It just isn't. Um, and then for some teachers, the difficulty in blogging for them is it is painfully hard sometimes to write out loud and to share what you're doing in your classroom. Now, yes, we completely believe everyone should do that. And we want to be the model for this type of sharing for our students. But the reality is, it is difficult to do. Um, and not that because it's difficult, we shouldn't. But I also think that sometimes we need other modes of sharing. So today, I'm going to show you some other modes of sharing that I really like that you can share quickly and that your students and your teachers can do as well. Some of my favorite tools are uh, Microsoft Sway, which I only just learned about at this past year's ISTE. And I've been using it between my personal and my school account. Um, so Microsoft Sway is a free product for anybody. You do not have to be a Microsoft using school to use Sway. I mean, when I show you kind of what Sway does, you'll understand. You do not have to be a Microsoft, um, a Microsoft using school. You can um, just have your personal account. If you have a Google account, you can create a Microsoft account with your Google account. Um, all of you, and actually every school, at least here in the States, and I know this is global, um, but you actually all have free access to Office 365, whether you use it or not. Um, so if you go on to Office 365 and verify your email address with a school account, um, then you actually have, like, you get like a little panel with this entire suite of tools in it. But we're not even going to make it that difficult. You can literally log in at Sway.com. And I'm going to share my screen and show you. Um, but, and then, of course, the other tool that I'm going to talk about are two Adobe products. One of them is Slate, which is, used to be iPad only, and now it is iPad and browser. So if you have um, Chromebook, hello, you can create um, from actually Sway and Adobe Slate on those Chromebooks. Um, and then, of course, is Adobe Voice, which I'm going to talk about a little bit later. Now, Adobe Voice is right now only on, um, only on iPad, but uh, let's just say they're working on other platforms, and I have to leave it at that and not have them sue me entirely. Uh, but uh, it is a great tool, and I'm going to show you some that are already created without telling you how they were created, and then you will have to fill in the blanks from there. I'll just say be on the lookout because news will come out soon. That is actually incredible news for creating with Adobe Voice in school. 
Um, so first, before I go into Sway, I want to talk about kind of what we're doing. And I'm sorry, this font is kind of tiny, but I created this in Google Slides and then had to export it as a PowerPoint. Then, of course, I lost all of my fonts because that's fun. Um, and then had to change it to a different font because that's even more fun. But Sway is actually available on any device. Um, and it creates a, um, it creates basically a one pager, like a website one pager. And it has this parallax effect. And I don't know if you know what parallax means. I actually had to look that up because it's like one of my favorite ones. So parallax is, um, it's sort of like an animated feature within a web where when you scroll, it's like the images and text move with it. And so like I created one of these in like five minutes for my cell phone. And the teachers in our ambassador group, I shared it with them first, and they were like, oh my gosh, that's so cool. And wow, you that's really cool animation. That's, and that was very hard. They honestly thought it was the hardest thing on earth to do. It was not. It literally took five minutes. But, um, but today, we're having our Hour of Code um, workshop here in our school district. And um, we've been sharing like all day just what the teachers are doing as they're learning with their code trainer. So I started creating my sway on my phone and um, started adding in pictures and text from my phone. And then I went to my browser and started creating the exact same sway on my browser. So you can access it on any device. You start creating it on one, you can still access it on another. And it's quite incredible. Um, so you can do text, images, video, office documents, tweets, and much more. Cell phone is a little bit limited, I'll be honest. Um, you can only do pictures and text. I don't think you can do video. I think it's just pictures and text um, from a, like a mobile phone or an iPad or a, well, I don't think it's in the Android store. I think it's just, it could be. I mean, if they put it on iOS, it could be an Android. Someone will have to check that for me because I honestly don't know. Um, but when I went to start working on my um, laptop, it did something weird. It would not let me edit because here's why. You cannot have an editable editing screen open on multiple devices. So if you start it on the phone, you need to close it out completely. Then you go to your um, to your to your um, browser, and then you can edit it. Because I was freaking out. I was like, surely they're not going to make me only be able to edit this on my phone. Um, but that's not the case. Um, so I got to go actually on my computer and finish it. Now I, I think that was the con. The other con is it is collaborative, and let me air quote that. And I know you can't see my air quotes, but trust me, I'm doing them. Um, it's collaborative in that I can add collaborators, but we cannot collaborate simultaneously. So if I'm creating, no one else can be in. I have to be out for another person to be in. Um, and us that kind of do this collaborative work in the world of Google, um, that's a little bit annoying because we want to all work together at the same time. But because of the way the, creati the creativity works in Sway, and when we go into it, you'll understand, um, it doesn't always, that's not necessarily the best thing to do. So I am going to share my screen with you now that I've learned how to do this. And I'm going, and can y'all see that? Good. So now I'm going to go into my Sway. So you just literally go to sway.com. Um, and I can actually share that. No, I cannot do that. I thought I could. Okay, I'm back. So you can actually go to sway.com. I thought I could paste it and do this, but you can't do both. Um, and so once you're here, you can click Get Started, and then it wants you to sign in. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and sign in with my school account. And it brought up the Office 365 window. Yay. So this is the collection of sways that I've created. And I'm going to open this one so you can see what it looks like. And this is the editing screen. So I'm going to go to play. And so when I scroll up, I want you to notice how the text, the images kind of scroll up with it. It has a really cool effect. You have some tweets that are created. Um, yeah, I've been curating tweets. So I'm going to show you how to do that. I've uploaded some images using um, another Microsoft product to actually turn those PDFs into images. Um, no, you don't have to. Do you need Office 360? What? 
I have no idea what's happening other than something is downloaded to my computer that I did not do. So I don't think y'all saw that, but that was weird. Okay, so I'm going to go back now. Um, so anyway, so to edit, and I'm going to show you this because this is happening live. I'm going to hit the edit tab, and you have these cards here on the left. So you have text. You have text in the heading. This large piece is a heading. The picture here shows in the background of that heading. Um, and then, of course, I have a text. Now, this is the part I don't like. Yes, my computer was weird. I got it. Something happened. Something I downloaded. I don't even know when I did it, but that might be why I keep getting Yahoo as my browser instead of Google, and that's just not going to work for me. But, but um, this is the part I don't like, and I've actually voiced this to Microsoft. I want to be able to put in a link, and it automatically creates a button that is like a stylized button, the color of maybe the scheme of the, the, the um, this way, but it doesn't. It just makes a link. So hopefully they'll fix that because I don't like it. Um, the other thing, like these are grouped um, into um, a, so that the images show up side by side or as a collection instead of one by one. Um, and to do that, I'm going to show you. Um, if I add, if I want to add something, I'm going to hit this little diamond. And so you see heading, text, image, upload. But when I do the, um, actually, that was not what was supposed to happen. It just added something. I think I just changed the screen. Um, there we go. So um, if I go down to media, there's pictures. But if I go down to group, this represents um, different ways to, so you can group pictures, video, or text so that it shows more of a collage. You'd want to choose from the group section. You can even do comparison, which I like. If I do comparison, you can add two pictures side by side, and then it gives you like a bar. I'm going to add this in, even though I'm not going to keep it. I'm going to add in. Um, that. Add. Okay, so that's my group comparison. So I'm going to go show you live what this looks like because it updates it live as we go. Um, on the left is one picture, on the right is another. You get a little slide that you can um, actually move between those pictures. So I can think of a ton of different things that I would like to do with this. And if I don't like this, I'm going to go back and trash this because I don't want to keep that group. And then my sway just goes back and it updates live. There's a question. If your group creates a Padlet to share during a workshop, can it be embedded into Sway and keep updating as any notes are added? It doesn't embed in that way. Now, that's another thing that I talked to them about. I just, I went to, really had a neat opportunity to go to Microsoft's offices a few weeks ago and talk directly to the people that make things. Um, and I might have given that guy an earful, and then he, I, I don't, I think he was kind of done with me after that. And that was one of them, is I wanted to be able to embed more than what they allowed me to embed. So I will show you exactly what can be embedded right now, but I will tell you that it's still a work in process, and so uh, in progress. So there's, there's all of these things that I'm showing you can change. Um, so let me get out of this. Oh, by the way, it searches through Creative Commons in order to find, um, you know, pictures or video. I honestly, so it's supposed to use Bing search, which it does. I have not seen an issue where it's pulled inappropriate pictures, but like anything else, anything else, especially when we're teaching kids about digital literacy, it's probably good to know that um, that you know if I'm an if I'm an artist and I upload a picture and label it Creative Commons, I can go in and label that picture any way I want. I might label it something completely different, so when you're searching. You might see something inappropriate that you shouldn't, even though it's labeled like it is safe. So just know still that those issues can happen. But I think that's where this can really get into um, how we talk to our students about um, what's appropriate and not appropriate. But I want to go back to the cards and show you um, a little bit more, and then I'll move on. Because um, I know I could really do an entire session on Sway. Um, so I'm going to add another tweet into this. When I click Add Tweet, it brings up the search bar. Now I'm going to go click Suggested and choose Twitter. And I'm going to look for our hashtag, Luskin Code. So here are a few. Um, oh, look, there's our, one of our principals. They're doing an unplug. So if I want to add this tweet, I'm going to go grab it and just drop it in. 
And so now that tweet is now added. If I want to add more, there's another one. I'm going to go add. You see, and I didn't even have to add another card. It recognizes it. So when I drop it in, it, it's there. So it's, it's added it there as well. Oh, okay. I clearly want to go get that. And I just saw it. I'm, I'm going to go back to that tweet later. So here's a few more. If I want to add these tweets, I can add them. And now when you go back, now of course I've put those in the wrong place. But I just wanted you to see how really quickly and easy you can do this um, from any device, and it's really fast. It's not, it's not you know, hard to do at all. Now, here's the fun part, publishing. Oh, no, I want to show you design. I have a specific design, but when I choose design, you have different designs and color schemes that you can choose. You can also customize within the design. You also have, um, wait, your answer about embedding, you can embed a live Twitter feed in the Slay right. Um, it doesn't embed the live Twitter feed. It embeds tweets that have already been tweeted, and you have to manually pull them over. Um, so I wouldn't use this necessarily as my complete and total curator like we do with Storify. But if I wanted to do some research about a particular story and the tweets were a part of it, this is definitely a place where I would do that. Um, one more thing, and then I do need to move on because we're going to run out of time. Um, navigation. So you have different types of navigation with Sway. Mine is navigating up, down, but I can also change my navigation so that it navigates horizontally. Some people like this style of sharing. Um, I'm not too particularly fond of it, but it is kind of cool the way it does that. And then you, of course, have just a standard page by page navigation. I don't know how that's nav. Oh, there it is. So this one just does a slideshow. You can look, I have controls in the bottom right. So when I do the actual, um, you know, I, I do my navigation arrows, that's how it changes. So it's not automated. I'm going to go back, though, because I'm going to change this back to vertical. You see everything's instantaneous. Um, these that I just added, if I didn't want those there, I can actually grab them and drag them down to this bottom group. Let me go back. I clearly didn't. There we go. So I can drag them to that bottom group instead, and, um, and they're there. And then I can drag it outside of it altogether. I thought I could. I guess I can't. I probably need to add a heading first, um, unplug, and now I'll drag it. So sometimes things work perfectly the way you want it to, and sometimes they don't. But it's all good. I think that's the same way with any technology. You just kind of have to figure out what works um, and then make it work according to that. But for our teachers to share what they're doing in class, this is a great way. So now I'm done. And, and even though I'm not done, I now have a live link that I can share. So to share it, I'm just going to click Share. And I have this mark so that people outside of my organization may see it because I am logged into my school account. I can make it private with just me. Um, it's completely public. I have more options. You can allow viewers to duplicate your sway. I'm going to uncheck that. Now, if I was doing something else, um, well, actually, I will do that because let's say I want the teachers might want to take this way we started and then add their own notes to it. If I have this on to duplicate, they can totally do that. And I think that's actually a pretty cool thing. Um, and then, of course, I click tweet, and you may not see that tweet, but I have. I'm going to copy this tweet, and then when I open up Twitter, I can share that tweet, and now it's shared. Um, but it's also going to still be a work in process. It's still going to be able to be edited by me on any device. Um, so that is one of my favorites, and it makes a really neat web page um, that didn't take but what, a few seconds to do? Maybe a few minutes, a little bit longer than I thought. But it's all good. So I'm going to go back to um, this. Oh, you know what? While I'm here, I'm going to go ahead and open up Slate and start talking about that one, if that's OK with you all. Are there any questions before I move on? Uh, yes, um, I can capture some. But Peggy says keep going, so we'll okay, cool. ask, ask oh, questions at the end. All right, cool. We will do that. Um, no problem. Um, so Adobe Slate is very similar to Sway. It, to me, honestly, 
is a little bit cleaner um, because it really does focus on the story itself. Adobe Slate was created with the idea of the students writing essays in class, that they're basically writing an essay and turning in pages and pages of words and no visuals. Um, and so realistically, when we do real world writing, we like to have visuals as a part of our work because they do help to enhance the story. Um, and so Slate is one of those that says, here, use pictures and text and we'll make it beautiful. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and start creating that. You should, of, of course, be on, um, oh, sorry, I already have an Adobe account. Let me log in with my Adobe ID. It used to only be, um, it used to only be on iPad, and then it only recently became browser-based as well. Uh, so I'm going to open this. Links, yeah, they'll share those links. So you can see what this one looks like, and it also has different types of themes. So I have, we have a group of digital ambassadors in our teachers. I'm sorry, in our district um, who are doing various challenges weekly. And this slate, and it has the same parallax effect. This one was created to showcase um, the work that they did in our week one. This is their um, slate on six word stories. And it's just all images, text, titles, and you can see these images in the background to really give a different type of effect to it. There's these different images rolled in the background. And then when I say link, this is a link. And it's just, I mean, it, 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 it makes a button. And I love that. Um, if I look at this on preview, so this one's different from Slay. Slay kind of does it side by side, edit and preview. Slay doesn't, Slay doesn't do that. I mean, once you're in, you're editing. And then once you're out of it, you are previewing or showing. But the same concept exists within these. Uh, but in this case, I'm going to go back to my home screen, and I'm just going to create a new story. And this is all me creating on the web. I can quickly add a title, and we'll find voice. Um, anytime there's a button, that means you can add something. Um, so my I can't spell, sorry. So I'm going to do the button and add a photo. And so here I can browse my computer. I can also find photos through um, Adobe has its own internal search. And um, so I like to search for sometimes off the kilter words. OK, that's good. Um, so I'm going to choose that one. And so it quickly creates the background behind it. And then scrolls to start writing. And so now I can do text. Um, this is a, this is about voice. I'm kind of last minute doing this. And so here again are my, my options. So I can add a new picture, add another text. If I add a link in this case, it says give me the button. Here is a button. What is my issue today? And then here is my link. And I can align it, left, center, or right, save, and so here's my button. And it automatically does the animation whenever you hover over it. You can also do what's called a glide show. Um, um, so I can add a few background photos to it. So I'm going to add that one. And then I'll add that one next. Oh, that one's huge. I don't like that one. But I can add that one, and then I can click. I'm not going to replace. Um, save. And so if I put a title on top of this, and we'll make this title Use Your Voice. Done. So now I have this effect where um, you have the picture or whatever scrolling there in the center. Um, so I'm going to add photo. And then here's where I can choose. Inline just puts it right there in, in the line in the script. Fill screen makes it full screen. Window puts it in the background. So now that image is all the way in the background. Um, and if you want to add a caption, you can. But now I'm ready to go to the next title. 
and then just continue to add. So if you're a student writing an essay or you're writing about your class, today we did blah, blah, blah. Uh, so you can do as much text as you want throughout the whole thing. And when you're finished, you have one one pager completed kind of story to tell with the scrolling parallax effect. And the same thing with sharing from Sway. When I click share, you can choose it to be public or private. I'm going to choose it to be private because I'm not really ready to make it public. Um, then you choose a category. I'll make it education. I love this part. When you roll pictures here, it automatically pulls in the, um, it automatically um, gives um, credit to those pictures where you got it from. And I love that. You can also, if you've uploaded your own pictures, you can also add citations for the other pictures that you brought in um, and give credit to another student that took pictures or, you know, the person in your district that took them or whatever the case may be. But I love the fact that um, giving credit to work, crediting work is built within this piece. Um, so that's Adobe Slate. And I know I'm not going to have a lot of time to talk about voice, but I do want to um, just kind of, I can give you a roundabout way that voice works. Um, let's just say I'm going to click this button. And when I click this button, uh, so voice actually makes a video. Similar to um, uh, what was the, 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 an app that I used to use where you had a, well, let's go with, trying to explain everything. Um, I can't remember the name of the app. Some of you might remember it where you have a slide for each student and then they can record on that slide. Um, whatever it was, I can't remember the name of it, but I know that it is, um, it's not free anymore, but this is completely free. So you have different themes and you can add a picture to this from your computer or searching in the same way. But if you hold this button down, you can actually record uh, whatever you want to say for that slide. So if I have students in a class, I would have them share a picture of the work that they want to share, do their recording, you're done with that particular slide. Next student, add a slide, do the same thing. And by the time you finish, you have one completed video of all of your student work. But that's not all. You have music. So if you, oh, they've added this, yay. So if you have music, you can go and choose one of Adobe's many awesome pieces for music, and you won't be able to see the video. Sorry, I don't know if it'll play that or not. But it'll actually finish the video and show you. And I have a link that's one that I've done for why I blog, that when we launched blogging in our district, that's the one that I shared, and I'll share the link to that one if I can get it. Um, uh, it might not it might not load that one. Um, but I'll share the link to that one if I can. All right, so it's not going to load right now. It might be because we're in this screen. I'm not sure. But, um, but play around with Adobe Voice on your iPad. And I know that I'm completely running out of time on this piece. Um, but I do want to honor your time in answering questions. Uh, but I guess the main thing is uh, just to, you know, we often talk about to share what you do in class as a tweet or hopefully as a blog, but providing, thinking through different ways of communicating is a great thing, and there are lots of great tools that help us do it in really creative ways. Um, so if you just take the time and explore tools like Sway or Slate or even Voice, um, you'll find different types of ways that, yes, you can share what's happening in your classroom, but you can still take those pieces and, um, and maintain them in your portfolio or, or on your other blog or embedding them on your website. Uh, so this gives you another mode of creating and a mode of communicating. Um, and it's, it's pretty powerful in my opinion. So hopefully you have gotten quite a bit out of that today. And I'm going to quit sharing and go back because I know that I'm out of time. Um, Adobe Voice right now is on iPad only. Um, and, and I say right now it is iPad only. And I'm, I'm not going to say it's any place else. I will also say that if you go to Adobe Voice's Twitter, they actually tweeted out a link that they were creating Adobe Voice for iPhone. And so you could click that to join the beta group of it. Now I've been and am a part of several of their beta groups. And the cool thing about their beta groups is that they do listen to your feedback. And when you ask for certain things to happen, it, they do it. Um, and, or, or they'll at least consider it. And I thought that was pretty powerful. 
Um, but yes, Adobe Voice, iPad only for now. Um, but it is, there is, there's a pick of a Chromebook. On the Adobe Voice site or Slate? Now, Slate is on Chromebook. All right, good. Um, so I, I'm going to stop so we can ask questions. I think Peggy said she had some. Yes, I did capture some questions. I'm not sure I'm going to remember Great. which ones you've answered already, <laughs> but we'll see how this okay. works. Um, going back to the top of my column, do you need to have Office 365 to use Sway? You need to create an account. It doesn't necessarily have to be Office 365. It can just be an account with Microsoft. So yes, okay. you will have to create an account to do it. Uh, then can all students have access to Sway? As long as they have if your students, So if, your stu if you have student email through mm -hmm. your school district, and if your students have, so if your students have student email in your school district, and of course you do too, you can actually create a free Office 365 account using your, using your school email. That is free for everybody. It doesn't matter if it's a Google account. You don't, it won't become at Microsoft. It just becomes, like my personal Sway is created with my Gmail. Um, mm -hmm. so I, and I just did that through creating um, just a Microsoft account through my Gmail, and it worked out just fine. So it's still a free product. Now, um, for us, we will have student email for all of our students, but we also have um, Office 365 accounts for all of our students. Your district, even though you aren't Microsoft, can still get that for free for everybody. So if you don't have student email, your students still can still have a Microsoft account. And that's something actually made available through the Connect at to the Future piece. Um, that was Microsoft's offering to U.S. schools was, Everybody can have an Office 365 account. Um, so whether you have an email or not, you would still have an, a Microsoft account. Mm -hmm. Okay, so here's the trick if you're not 13. Um, and this is what um, I'm actually going to do with Adobe uh, because Adobe's current logins right now are only Adobe and right. Facebook. And for our younger kids, that's not going to work. So I honestly created one generic account like with a Gmail for my office. And I created our Adobe account with that one account, and I put it on all of the iPads, and that's how they log in. So it works out just fine. I end up with all of my student work under one account and so I can see all of it. We have a great honor system going on with students, so that has not been an issue. Uh, but that's, that's been our workaround, so you can definitely do that with that one account. Okay. Um. Let's see, this, I don't know if this was, this seems like it was with Sway. Uh, would, it sounds like it's something like a class page or a school page. Would you drag and drop something in a card? Does it replace the old card or would you have a long list of cards or whatever the content is? You, yeah, if you drag on top of a card, it replaces the old card. Oh, okay. I think that was Sway. Um, what's the technical word for the scrolling feature? I think this was Sway too, although the question writer typed in Slate, but you hadn't started talking about Slate yet. Um, yes, it's called Parallax. 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 And that is an actual, Lex. I have to look that up because I was working on, I'm about to redesign my blog, and I was like, I want something I think that has sort, sort of that effect. Mm -hmm. um, and I found it. It's called Parallax. I was, I was like, wow, I didn't even know that was a real word. A parallax is actually a term from astronomy, so I'm surprised it's something that can also be applied to a web page, but that's an interesting comparison. Um, I think it's EX, it's parallax. Parallax instead of parallax. Mm -hmm. Parallax is, Par the, uh, parallax. is the astronomy term. Yeah. Uh, let's see. So the, the, well, there's a question, what is parallax? It is the scrolling effect that you would see on a sway um, when you just, um, when you just, um, when you scroll and it animates in. Um, so like I showed you one that I was creating on uh, my computer that started mm -hmm. on my phone. 
But I have one that I, so we did five picture stories in our um, ambassador group. And, um, and I just did it with Sway from my phone in less than five minutes. All I had to do was add pictures from my phone, add some text in between, and it was done. And, when, and that's the one that when the teachers saw it, they went, what? That looks, that looks like it's, you know, it's, um, I, can, I can share the link to that here. You know, they thought that it was a little bit like I'd actually taken a lot of time to do it. I was quite impressed with that, uh, that they actually thought it took that long, and it didn't. I'm going to post the link to this one in the comment section so you can see the one done on my cell phone that, you know, it was a, a really quick process. So is voice inside Adobe Slate, or is it separate? That's a good question, because you saw that, didn't you? Yeah. Um, <laughs> Um, Somebody else did too so because it was a question. They did. So uh, technically, technically, it is not. Um, mm -hmm. Technically, it is on. Well, it's on iPad only. Mm -hmm. and, but and then what Slate is on iPad and also on browser. Mm -hmm. But I am. Um, I'm a part of the test group with Adobe. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. mine was actually you saw all of the stories, whether it was Slate or Voice, in one screen. I, can't, okay. I don't know if they're going to continue with doing it that way. Mm -hmm. I have no idea. Um, but I, I kind of like it a yeah. little bit. So hopefully in the, the next month or so, yeah, hopefully in the next month or so that announcement will be made. And then when you log into Slate, you'll start to see voice as well. Mm -hmm. so now Sway was browser based, I think. Yes. Um, somebody asked. Browser and phone. Browser and phone. Somebody asked, can I install Sway on my PC if I install iTunes? That might be a Slate question. Um, actually, none of, so Sway or Slate, none of those are, oh, you mean can you install it to the device? I'm not sure. Right. Um, install it to a PC rather than a, an iPad or a. No, the well, Sway is browser based. Okay. So, and Slate, so you can just log into the website and use it. Mm -hmm. There's nothing to install. So if you're on a Chromebook, you can use it. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah, that, that was the question, but it, it's, yeah, that's what I read. And it's browser-based, so it, you don't need yes. iTunes to install it. Sway no, Sway. Now, it's also on iPad, so if you want mm -hmm. to put Slate on your iPad, you can. But it is mm -hmm. entirely, you can create entirely in your browser. Okay. And Peggy wanted me to ask you about your hour of code that you were going to talk about that you're doing sure. this week. We are fully participating in Hour of Code in Luskin ISD. We have never done Hour of Code in Luskin. Ever. Um, so this is a just a truly remarkable thing to see people just kind of dive into wanting to do it. I created a s'more for our teachers, and I will share that to you so you can see it um, with kind of how we're doing it and some of our options. Um, maybe what you don't see are, are kind of um, so we're in our little coding class right now. They're here that they're doing a, a workshop to kind of learn about it. Um, so we're asking all of our teachers um, across the district and all of our campus at 100% to give their students an hour to code. Some of our schools are doing things like drop everything in code. You know how we do drop everything and read? I thought that was cool. Um, and then some of our schools are just um, embedding the time throughout the day that they've booked in labs or in different places. But what our teachers are learning today, and this has truly been phenomenal, is how they can do this without making it about coding. In other words, the PE teacher who is um, going to do like, um, so if you think about coding, it really is a set of um, a programming or a set of instructions that creates um, an output. It's, it's a big input that creates an output. So if we think about all the different tasks that we do on a daily basis, how you can see how coding fits into our daily lives, um, that's a way to get kids to think about or think in terms of computational thinking um, and how to create something and how to be innovative. All of these pieces add to that. 
Um, so the PE teacher was like, I'm just going to, we're doing jump roping that day, but we're going to do it through code. So some of the, um, the, the instructions that they would have with some creative jump roping, they're going to do it in steps and in loops. And then the kids will have to repeat it. But that was something they were already going to do. So it's not an extra, we're going to get on a computer. We're actually coding unplug. Um, because computational thinking doesn't mean it only has to happen on a computer. It's that piece of logic that adds, that, that feeds that math part of our brain that happens throughout what we do. So we are doing it from our pre-K, that is three-year-olds, all the way through our 18-year-olds. And even our teachers are coding as well. That's wonderful. Those were the questions that I was able to capture. So we'll Yay. head to the next slide. And I think I'm turning the mic over to, to Peggy, who will talk about what's coming up next. <laughs> I was dying to hear more about what we're friends personally is going to be doing with our code next week because she is you want me to going tell to you? be very busy. Yes. And then uh, I'll talk about well, upcoming shows. Well, Monday, the White House is hosting the um, Computer Science Education Week Tech Jam with um, a, a few educators from around the country and some technology developers and different types of leaders. And we are going to launch Computer Science Education Week um, to create some new things and to, to really ideate some ways to integrate um, com com computational literacy, that's the word, into K-6 curriculum so that it's not something that's just done during the week of Hour of Code, but it's something that happens um, throughout the year. So I'm really excited to do that. And then Thursday, I'll be back at the White House again for the um, Future next um, launch next phase of Future Ready and the launch of the National Technology National Education and Technology Plan. So you'll hear a lot more about that on Thursday as well. And if any of you are in Connecticut, I'm keynoting Atomic Math in Connecticut on Tuesday, um, and where I'm going to talk about um, passion and creativity in the math class. So um, it's going to be an insane busy week. Wow, my district is coding. And our hashtag, if you follow us. It's Lufkin Blocks. No, that's not it. It's Lufkin Code. That's our hashtag for Twitter. Um, and we're encouraging everybody to share what we're doing. And we're not just focusing on coding. We're really also we're also amplifying the work that is already happening through our computer science program and robotics across the district. So um, we're really excited and, and really even more excited that more of our kids are going to get to have these opportunities. Thank you so much for sharing that. Your excitement just bubbles over, and it's very contagious. So I'm really glad to know that you're going to be involved in all of those things. Well, we have, I want to thank you so much, friends, for fitting us into your schedule. And we have all learned a bunch of new things today that we're eager to try out. So thank you for that. Um, we have two more great shows coming up before our winter break. Uh, Dr. Lodge McCammon is going to be joining us next week. And he's going to cover a lot of things. But his real specialty is music in the K-12 classroom. And he's going to be sharing his 50 State Songs project with us. But he's also going to be talking about um, his paper slides and his um, flip learning uh, work that he's done so much. You're going to want to be here for that. And then the following week, Vicki Sedgwick is joining us. And she's going to spend her time talking about ways that you can extend Hour of Code way beyond the week or the hour that you get started with. And that will be so helpful to have some of those ideas uh, to carry forward with. And you may even have some time over your winter break to play with some of them. So then we'll take our winter break for two weeks. And when we come back on January 9th, we'll do our celebration show. It's a year in review where we take time to 
celebrate and recognize all of the people who presented for us throughout 2015. And it's always a fun time. We usually have some giveaways. So we hope you'll come and join us on January 9th. So thank you all for joining us. And Lori, you can take us out. Thanks, Peggy. The Hour of Code link is here. So if you want to go to their site to find ideas for the Hour of Code, you can do that. The Learning Revolution Project is Steve Hargadon's latest. He has gathered together all of his professional development resources in one place, including the Host Your Own Webinar series. You can sign up for a Blackboard Collaborate room. And as long as your session that you're planning is public, it's a free session. You can nominate a featured teacher for the month at this link. You can also nominate yourself. When you exit the session, the Classroom 2.0 Live survey should open in your browser. You can also take the link from the chat box, or it's in the Live Binder in the Resources tab. When you've completed the survey at the bottom, you can request a professional development certificate for the session. Uh, type your name in the name field, and it will appear on the certificate. Please make sure this is a personal email address that you have this sent to. Schools tend to block this from getting to you. Oops. The video and archive, the video and audio archives, or the uh, are also on iTunes U besides on the page, either the full recording or an RSS feed of the show archives. So there are many ways to get to the show archives. Again, special thanks to Refrance Davis, to Steve Hargandon, the founder of Classroom 2.0, Teacher 2.0, Future of Education and the Learning Revolution, to Blackboard Collaborate for our webinar platform, and to everyone who participated in today's show. Thank you so much.